On behalf of the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, I'd like to welcome you to the PBS CCS podcast. I'm your host, Chris Messina. guys so on today's episode it's going to be another group chat i'm going to have the guys introduce themselves and then we're going to get into their relationship that they had uh when they were with the cardinals together a little pretext before we get in too much uh, i heard them speak together on a separate podcast and some of the content that they brought up made me uh reach out and make sure i get them on so i'm going to have them introduce themselves and then we're going to get right into their working relationship that they had and and how they navigated those waters. So we'll have David go first, and then uh, Johnny, you can go after. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate you having me here and inviting me. My name is David Meyer, physical therapist. I work with Johnny Larson with the St. Louis Cardinals. I was the medical and rehab coordinator. Uh, Jonathan was the strength coach for Palm Beach at the time. We've become best friends ever since, and I still stay very close into the game of baseball in terms of baseball development with athletes. I started my own podcast called the Injured to Elite Podcast, which is all about taking a physical challenge or a non-physical challenge and still going towards your dreams, whether you're an athlete or not. And uh, just really uh, excited to be here with you guys today. I'm uh, Johnny Larson, uh, as Dave mentioned and Chris mentioned before, uh, strength and conditioning coach, uh, started my career as a intern at Army West Point under coach uh, Scott Swanson. Tana Burge, Michelle Carone, and Kyle Farrell, who are all still very highly active in the strength and conditioning community, more so in the college setting now. Uh, from Army, I went to Alabama, uh, where I was a grad student in their human performance department, um, where I was also working in the weight room under Coach Scott Cochran, Terry Jones with football specifically, uh, as well as under Michelle Diltz uh, with Alabama softball, and then ran the programming and conditioning for Alabama cheerleading. Uh, which led me to my position with uh, the St. Louis Cardinals, uh, reported to spring training February 14th, 2015. And uh, during which this time I was uh, designated as the uh, high A uh, Palm Beach strength and conditioning coach, um, where I work specifically with Palm Beach, as well as uh, some of the rehabilitation athletes under Dr. David Meyer. Um, also had the opportunity to assist Pete Prinzi and Rachel Balkovec on big league camp that year as well. Uh, continue on my career working as a head strength coach in Manhattan College as well as a baseball strength coach and interim director at Florida Atlantic University uh, most recently. Uh, it's hilarious that you remember your first day of spring training because I also remember mine. Um, it's probably ingrained in our memories forever just for various reasons. But yeah, like I mentioned, uh, I had heard you guys speaking on David's podcast. And one of the things that you guys had talked about jokingly was one of you breaks the athlete and then the other fixes them. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And as joking as it was, I could tell that you guys are very close and just talking for almost an hour before we even got the recording going, I can tell how close you guys are. Um, and so the overarching theme for today's podcast is going to be that working relationship you guys had. Um, we can just kind of discuss, generally speaking, your relationship and then how you guys, you guys kind of defined your role separately to make things work for athletes, any difficult situations you had, and then any advice really that you have for strength coaches or ATs or PTs or whoever listening to help build those relationships. I think you guys can agree that this is an incredibly important relationship in baseball, the strength coaches and the medical staff working together for the betterment of the athlete. And I think sometimes, I don't know if it's egos or whatever it is, they tend to get in the way where it's like, well, I was the one that made him better. No, I was the one that made him better. No, they're making him worse. No, no, it's his fault. Like, instead right. of just putting the athlete at the center and making that the focal point. So first and foremost, just kind of get into, you know, maybe that first year in the Cardinals together and then how that relationship has kind of progressed since then. And we can kind of go from there. Sure. <clears throat> Dave, you want to? Yeah. Can I take, take it? it off? Yeah. I, I like how you guys are talking about the first day. One of the first memories I have is Johnny and Esteban Doria coming into the minor league training room side. And I was, I was there for a month with the Cardinals, came down early to get my bearings. I'm this physical therapist. I just came off a sports residency at HSS in New York. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is my dream. I always wanted to work in baseball. 
And I'm just, I'm literally just learning lay of the land. And these guys, you know, both of them, they both practice what they preach. They're avid Olympic in style and lifters and power lifters. And they come into the room <laughs> like two guys in Brooklyn. And they put me up to a corner and they're like, so Dave, uh, what are your thoughts on rehabilitation? And they start giving me 21 questions. And I'm like, <laughs> first of all, I'm happy that there's two other guys that I can connect with right now because I was all here alone for a month and they 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 were you know they were testing me they were smelling me out and my with them or against them and I'm like I I think it, it was just kind of actually it, it, it was fun to talk to them instead of talking to Gary LaRock the farm director because every day he was busting my chops and so right from there I hear Johnny's got a thick New York accent I'm like oh thank god somebody here from New York. This is, first of all, what I need in Jupiter, Florida. Uh, and just another quick little entry point. I mean, this is like our first week together and we're standing outside the uh, multi-purpose cafeteria room and I barely know him, but we're, we're obviously connecting a lot every down moment. We're like, oh, how you doing, man? You hanging in there? And he's out there and he's texting and he's, he takes me aside like he just found out that we went through another recession or something. And he's like, Dave, I got this girl I'm talking to. And uh, <laughs> sorry, spot here. And he's this whole drama he's got going on. I'm like, where did you come from? <laughs> quickly bonded. Yeah. We quickly bonded. Yeah, between the, uh, the drama and the New York accents and our love of baseball, it, uh, that's definitely what uh, catapulted our our friendship and our working relationship for sure. And, you know, I, uh, I'll never forget the earlier days in spring training, obviously, Chris, as you know, um, you know, typically strength coaches, um, you know, we'd lift very, very early in the morning and get our day started and out of the way, because the majority of the morning was dedicated to the big league guys. Um, then we'd hit lunch. And then as soon as the big league guys got out of there for the day, all the minor league guys would come in and, you know, by the end of the day, after cleaning up the weight room and going over the daily briefings for the day and so forth, I mean, you know, it was so late by the time you get out of there that you wanted to get your workout in early. And, uh, you know, I was fresh out of that Scott Cochran, Alabama mindset. So the sports medicine training room, as well as the strength and conditioning side, all had glass windows that looked into the weight room naturally. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget Dave's face. I'd walk in there, you know, five, five o'clock in the morning, and I'd have young Jeezy blasting through that garage door of a weight room in, in Jupiter. And I'm sitting there, you know, warming up my snatch complex and he's looking through the window at me like, who, who is this guy? This is baseball. What are you, what are you doing? You know? And, uh, you know, several of those guys with the Cardinals organization had to, you know, tone, tone, tone down the volume a little bit. Um, I was a little too co coach Cochran for, uh, for professional baseball. So that was, uh, those are some fond memories that uh, kind of initiated and catapulted our relationship. That and me uh, casually walking down the hallway with John Mosaliak the general manager of the Cardinals and talking to him like he was my drinking buddy. <laughs> Forget another moment. We're going into the, so Johnny was helping with big league camp and I was given access to big league camp too, which was awesome. My first uh, spring training and they're helping, they're allowing me to observe the big league club and see how they operate, <clears throat> especially in case any of those guys were in rehab and at least they knew who I was. And I'll never forget, I'm like sneaking in to get a little bite to eat in the big league, uh, the big league uh, kitchen. And I, and I yep. comfortable as it was. And, you know, Johnny's like my alter ego, like my, my, who was at the time was like my dream alter ego. I'm like, I got to be more like this guy. And I hear a voice. I'm like, that sounds like Johnny. And then I hear another voice. I'm like, that sounds like John Moseliak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, is he having a conversation with Mo? And I come in, he's talking about, you know, Alabama football. And I'm like, dude, you were just in the weight room lifting to young Jeezy doing that. And now you're talking to the GM who, you know, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that conversation too. Cause um, they, you know, Mike Matheny and a bunch of the other Derek Lilliquist, who was the pitching coach at the time, a bunch of guys were sitting in the big league uh, kitchen area, eating breakfast for the day. And I'm sitting there talking to all of them and, oh man, did I appreciate those three to four weeks in that big league kitchen, man. Cause once you get sent over the minor league kitchen, it's a disaster. <laughs> and um, we're sitting there talking and I'll never forget the look on Dave's face. Cause you know, John Mosella kind of asked me in front of everybody, like, what was it like to be in the weight room and associated with a program under Nick Saban? And it flew right off the tip of my tongue. And I was just like, you know, one of the things that I really appreciated about Nick Saban is the fact that 
you know, this was his program. But when it came to strength and conditioning, him and his coaches stayed far away from the strength coaches and out of the weight room and let us do our jobs. I think that's one of the biggest things I liked about him. And then when that came out of my mouth, Dave looked at me like deer in the headlights. Like, I don't know who this guy is, but I need to get the hell away. I need to get the hell away from him. <laughs> Going to the, so. the big league kitchen too many times after that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, that's all relevant stuff. And, and uh, I mean, most strength coaches listening will know that the 5 a.m. lift in spring training is pretty standard and the music gets a little too loud for some people very early in the morning. And I, the thing is, for, for me, like, we start early and lift. And, Johnny, like you said, we're there all day with the guys in the weight room. And the music is loud all day. And, like, oh, by yeah. the end of the day, you are like, I don't want anything except absolute silence. And so sometimes oh, yeah. when the ATs come in and turn it down, like, secretly, I'm like, oh, my, thank God. Like, <laughs> I got, you know, 10 more hours of loud music in my near future. So maybe we should have a little bit of silence and then, like, the one day where you don't put music on, everybody's like, wait a minute, where's the music? Where's the music? What's going on? Oh. Just let me have my silence, please, this morning. Oh, it was, I just it was, it. It, it, was, it was such a buzzkill, man, because I'm, I'm very big on weight room culture. And, well, I was at the time anyway when I first came out of Tuscaloosa. And, you know, we'd have Jay-Z, Lil Wayne, everybody blast on the speaker system. It was such a vibe for a weight room. I loved it. It was 5 a.m. I just tossing bars around in a Lico place, flying all over the place. I loved it. And – you know, as soon as Mike Matheny and some of the pitching coaches and Okendo would come in and stuff like that, they'd go right up to the speaker system and put on like Travis Tritt or Jason Aldean. And I'm just like, oh, what a buzzkill. <laughs> Strength coaches in baseball are well versed in music, whether they want to be or not. You don't have a choice because yeah. somebody's going to come in and change the music. And then the thing is, by the end of the day, like if a guy comes in, it might be the first time he's listened to Post Malone that day. It's like the yeah. ninth or tenth time that you've heard circles by Post Malone, and you're like, "Oh <laughs> my God, can we listen to something else?" But you can't. Like, if they want to listen to it, you got to listen to it. So it's, it's yeah. definitely a give and take, and you learn to appreciate. It. At at one point, and like later in spring training, it all just becomes noise, and you like honestly, sometimes I just tune it out, and I'm like, I don't even know what's on the radio right now. Like, I'm I'm locked in on coaching, um, locked in on your program, and hey, did you hear that song? Like, no, I missed it. Have, honestly, I have no idea what it is. Um, because it's been loud music for nine straight hours for seven straight weeks for sure. But no, it's Absolutely. awesome. I can tell you guys are really close. And like I said, we talked for almost an hour before this, just how you guys have stayed um, in touch over the years. How long were you guys in the Cardinals organization together? So we were together in the organization for a year. I was with the Cardinals 2015, 16, 17 for three seasons. Um, but in that one year, Johnny, I mean, it's unbelievable how we connected in, in really a short amount of time. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, to, to touch on that, uh, you know, I, I was there in 2015, um, and it, an opportunity came up for me that I just – I couldn't say no to. And, and, Chris, I'm sure you can appreciate this being a, a full-time, you know, career strength coach. Um, I had an opportunity to, to come back to New York City, my home, and more specifically the Bronx. Um, you know, to come be the first ever director of strength and conditioning at Manhattan College. I mean, I had an opportunity to build a culture from the ground up, build my own weight room, literally. I mean, I went to Home Depot and literally built those platforms myself. Um, you know, so I, when I had an opportunity to jump on that, I just, I couldn't say no to it. Um, you know, not because I didn't love baseball. I, I did. And, you know, to this day, I mean, I, the, the journey that you're on now in AAA with the Red Sox organization and you know, very well, you know, on your way to, to the big leagues one day. I mean, that's something that I, I still kind of always have sitting in the back of my head. But, uh, yeah, we were together for that year. But I, Dave, Dave can touch on this. Every single school and program I went to there after the Cardinals, at some point in time when Dave had some downtime, I'd have him come to Manhattan College. I'd have him come to FAU and, you know, come and talk to some of my players. I'd introduce him to some of the baseball coaches and stuff and, you know, kind of, you know, pick his brain about what, what are the current trends in the pro industry that I can kind of transition here into the college setting. Um, so even though we, we grew apart, you know, professionally in, in terms of seeing each other every day, I mean, he was still very much a big influence on my career and some of the decisions I made in every program that I went to thereafter. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, you never really left the game. I mean, players still reach out to you, right, Johnny? A ton of players, big league, minor league guys, Ryan Sheriff is a very close, uh, one of our close buddies for both of us. And we all still connect all the time. And he comes to us for, for advice, strength and conditioning, rehab. And so 
Yeah. I mean, we, we might've even gotten closer after our time with the car after your time with the Cardinals, which is, yeah, no, no, for sure. Cause you know, our, 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 our identity at the time, and, and Chris, you can appreciate this, you know, when you're with an organization and you're in the heart of a season, you know, your, your identity is, you know, you're the AAA strength coach and, and I'm there to serve the players. I'm there to work with the ATC and, you know, whatever else I can do for the organization, that's your life, you know, from five o'clock in the morning until you go to bed at night, regardless of what hotel you're sleeping in. Um, and so once I left the game, um, you know, our, our relationship kind of took a different direction where it became more about of a, you know, a, a personal friendship more so than a, Hey Dave, you know, we got to go over Tommy Pham's rehab program today. You know, let's, let's touch up on your notes and, you know, show me what you want me to do with them in the weight room. It became a little bit more, you know, family oriented and, and ventures outside of the game. So um, it's definitely, uh, you know, definitely thankful for that. Yeah, yeah. Lot- we all need that guy in our lives for sure, whether it's professionally or just outside of work. And it, it tends to be one or two people within an organization that you just click with right away. And it's for whatever reason. I mean, like you said, Johnny is like your super alter ego. Maybe that was what it was mm-hmm. for you. And you guys just clicked and whatever it was that made you click, like that is going to be a lasting friendship for you, whether you work together or not. You're always going to be on the phone with each other, texting each other, visiting each other, FaceTime each other, whatever it is, just because you clicked right away. And it sounds like you guys clicked almost immediately. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and that and that really transitioned over, um, you know, into our partnership, you know, with the Cardinals. I, I think a big thing that attracted players to us was the fact that we were like this. Yeah, you, you ever watch uh, Home Alone, like uh, Marvin Harry, two <laughs> burglars? We were like Marvin <laughs> Harry at a Home Alone or, or Abbott and Costello, you know what I mean? Like it was always – it was, it was like, you know, this is a DPT and a strength coach, but I, I sound like I'm, I'm, I'm watching a comedy skit on television with these two, you know what I mean? Because of our personalities. And I think, especially in the minor leagues, you know, there's like this big thing with, you know, you don't want to be blacklisted and you don't want to say you have an injury because then you're going on the injured list and then, you know, kiss any, any kind of forward movement goodbye. Um, so I think the fact that we kind of showed who we are personally with our players um, – I think it helped develop a certain level of trust with them. Whereas maybe with some other professionals in our organization or in others, um, they weren't as quick to kind of let their guard down and and communicate and be transparent about certain things, whether it be family life, personal issues, um, injuries, bumps and bruises and things like that. Yeah. And that's kind of what I wanted to hit on next was how you guys are defining those roles when you're working with certain players how you're building that trust with them and communicating effectively between the two of you, because Dave, I, I believe you're CSCS, right? Yeah. 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 So, so you have an understanding of the strength and conditioning um, side of things. And I think sometimes ATs don't necessarily have that understanding and strength coaches get frustrated with it instead of just explaining like, listen, this could be a progression and working together. Um, so how do you kind of stay within your lane, but still use each other and bounce off of each other um, to give the athlete the most. Because like we said, at the end of the day, it's all about the athlete, right? Yeah, Chris, I think you kind of hit it on the head when you were speaking at the beginning there about the player first. And I, or maybe we were talking about that before we even started the the episode here. But I think for Johnny and I, it always revolved around this idea. I mean, we joked around about he breaks them, I fix them. Um, but, you know, it really always revolved around the idea that first of all, we both shared a love of the game. I've always loved the game of baseball. And before I became a physical therapist, before I got my doctorate from NYU in physical therapy, I'm not an athletic trainer. Uh, I just did a sports residency, but I, I was first training myself as a ball player. I played community college baseball. I played club up in Albany, not far from where you grew up or, you know, upstate New York. And for me, what I looked into as a, an athlete was uh, Mark Verstagen. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right, with uh, Athletes Performance, the original Athletes Performance before it was Exos. And my knowledge of strength and conditioning on the baseball side grew from that. I created my own program, and I also trained at Professional Physical Therapy in Garden City that has a performance center on, under Rob Panarello, who's a big-time strength coach. Uh, and... So for me, before I was ever even a PT, I was interested in the strength and conditioning side. Not to say that my knowledge base is what you guys have, because it's not at this point. We all have our unique kind of areas. But to answer your question specifically in terms of how we stay in our lanes, I think we both kind of 
we didn't frame it in the idea that a lot of organizations have with stay in your lane. We rather prioritize the athlete and we developed rapport. And I think both of us, we just tried to complement each other and play off each other's personalities where, look, sometimes we were playing good cop, bad cop. I mean, sometimes Johnny was the good cop. I was the annoying rehab coordinator that was saying, no, no, no. And then Johnny took him aside and say, listen, we're going to get a nice lower half lift in. I know you're down and you know, in the dumps because your elbow is bummed out, but let's go get a lift. Let's get some blood going. And I think we both really complimented each other well because we always put the, the game of baseball and the athlete above our titles. That's not to say that I don't have an ego or Johnny doesn't have an ego. I think we both, you know, we certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> no, human beings. I mean, you know, we all want to feel important and significant. So I'm not, I'm not, somebody to to come on a podcast and sound self-righteous but at the end of the day I think Johnny and I you know he's wearing the Yankee hat right now I mean I grew up a diehard Mets fan I lost my father when I was 21 who was a diehard Mets fan and that was I I vowed to my family I was gonna take my career somewhere really special and for me it was baseball and so I never lost sight of that it was never about job security for me it was never about fear. It was always about, I love this game. I am so blessed to be here. And when I met a guy like Johnny, a strength coach, where it's so important to have that implementation for my guys in rehab, I think I, I usually almost always, I would say, I saw the, the human connection there above everything. And from my two cents, not to get too off on a tangent, but I feel like we lose the human connection in professional sports so much. And that's what we prioritized. Yeah, no, for sure. I, and, you know, to piggyback off of what Dave just said, um, I think it's fair to say probably more for the strength and conditioning side of things than physical therapy or athletic training. Um, and Chris, you may or may not agree with me on this, but I feel like a lot of us, you know, get into weightlifting early on as, as a kid, um, you know, through trials and tribulations, you, you find the weight room, you find training, and it's it first comes in that form of, you know, year-round hypertrophy training. You get the encyclopedia, Arnold Schwarzenegger's book of bodybuilding and things like that. And, you know, it transforms over time. You study exercise science, uh, kinesiology, sports nutrition, and then you start to take the, the more professional development route to being a strength coach, right? Um, but I think, I think there's a natural egocentric nature to being a strength coach. And I, and I think a lot of – it took a lot of uh, – looking in the mirror for me to understand that, um, you know, earlier on in my career, I, I wanted to be a New York city version of a Scott Cochran, you know what I mean? And, and it takes a lot of self-awareness to understand that. And I think that through time and maturity, you know, in, you know, over the years, I've been able to kind of transition out of that, but that's what it was. And so when, when it came to my working relationship with Dave and being with the Cardinals, um, I think one thing that helped, form our relationship and a mutual respect for one another is that we were constantly learning from one another. Um, you know, if I go into the training room, you know, he was the one teaching me the MBIs, which was um, part of the training, the sports medicine training protocol uh, for the sports medicine side of things with the Cardinals that year. Um, he was teaching about hip distractions and cervical manipulations. And, you know, this is how you use a Graston tool. And this is, this is what's important about Graston and, and cupping and things like that. And, you know, if you have a guy who's getting some, you know, quad tendonitis or patellofemoral pain, this is why maybe loading him with a weight bearing exercise isn't as beneficial as maybe a body weight eccentric control based exercise and learning that stuff from him. But then on the flip side of things, when it came, when he walked into the weight room, he's trained before he's no dope. He knows his way around a weight room and knows his way in and out of a squat rack. But, you know, when it came to, you know, Johnny, like, let's, let's snatch today. I want you to teach me how to snatch. You know what I mean? I want you to teach me how to clean. You know, why would an athlete do a clean pull and not just do a hang clean? Like we were constantly picking each other's brains and learning from one another. And I think that's one of the things outside of our natural New York connection. I think that's something that kind of propelled our professional relationship moving forward is we we're constantly learning from one another. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, just for the record, I don't do cervical manipulations, maybe just some uh, thor thoracic manipulations, but I think <laughs> maybe, maybe Johnny feels like I give him a cervical uh <laughs> when I say some of the things I do, but yeah, when you talk too much, <laughs> <laughs> see, that's a taste of it, but I, he's right. We would pick each other's brains and you know what? And, and I, I think this is an important thing. We weren't fearful of talking about it in an open manner where 
look, I mean, yes, Johnny and I are comfortable calling each other out, but you know what the nice thing about it is? And I think some organizations can learn something from this. When you call each other out in a, in a, in a respectful manner, because we respect each other. I personally think Jonathan is one of the best, you know, coaches of Olympic style lifting out there that I know. And I've done a little research, but I mean, he knows how to coach from a cueing standpoint, from how to internalize the movement, bar path, all those things. I mean, he is truly an expert. And so that's why I would go to him when I was trying to improve my, my lifts. But we always had that respect for one another, which allowed us to call each other out. And when we called each other out, it wasn't like we were afraid that someone's going to walk out of the room and not want to talk to the other person for a week. It was simply that we put it out there. It was our way. It doesn't work for everybody. Not everybody can kind of raise the tension up like that. But for us, we were able to make progress very quickly. I mean, I don't want to get into politics and things like that. There's different styles for everybody. But the style that worked for Jonathan and I were, let's get it out there. Let's hash it out. And we came up with a decisive plan of action for our athletes when we did have that. And it wasn't, it was no feelings hurt. The feelings were checked in. We always had a love for each other. I mean, we always will. If he says something I don't agree with, I'm okay with it. It's not going to change how I see him as my friend or my colleague. It's just going to influence maybe the conversation we have. And I think in this day and age with social media and the performance department culture in professional baseball, there's a lot of people that are working walking on eggshells. I was one of them. Unfortunately, I didn't have this relationship with everybody in the Cardinals organization that John, Johnny and I had. I wish I did, but the reality is a lot of the listeners out there might not have that relationship. And I don't think that's reason not to have it. I think it's reason to just try and push the envelope a little, excuse me, try and push the envelope a little further and try and start with that human connection first Maybe it's just learning more about your colleague outside of the game first before you have that conversation about um, whatever the science is. Yeah, it's, um, you know, and and just to, you know, further touch on that, it's, I think what your listeners can get out of this, if they don't already have it in place within their own organization, is this industry as a whole, not just in professional baseball or college baseball, needs to move away from this whole I'm the strength coach, you're the sports scientist, and you're the athletic trainer. So stay in your own lanes, and let's just continue to bounce the athlete around the three different departments when, it, when it's suitable, right? It's how can the three of us merge together for the, benefic- for the benefit, the future benefit of that athlete or that team, um, or for the minor league in general, right? It's, it's how can we merge our personalities and our thought process together, not I'm going to stay in the weight room, you stay in the training room, and the sports science guy, you stay over there in the office and stay there. And then when I want to have a conversation with you about something, we'll have a conversation. I, I think it needs to be more of a, a, a team effort, team oriented effort. You, you may not like each other, but I think that, you know, you have to have a mutual respect for one another and it needs to be more of a blending and a melting pot than it is segmented departments all working on the same goal. Does that make sense? hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. A few things for me first, like with calling each other out, it's gotta be the New Yorker thing. I like beg people to call me out on my nonsense and they like just won't do it. And then when I call them out, like they get offended and I'm like, this is just who I am. Like, I'm not trying to be an ass. I'm just telling you, like, you did this wrong. This is how you could do it better. If I do something wrong, I expect you to call me out on it as well. Um, But going along the lines of just, you know, the, the communicating and just having um, maybe not necessarily like blurred lines, but just, again, if you put the athlete first, all of those things go to the side. I think the ego aspect for strength coaches is just sometimes we feel, um, I don't know if it's forgotten or overlooked or like we need to puff our chest out because, Hey, look what we're doing. See, we're doing this to help this guy. This is like, we have to validate what we're doing almost um, where like the training room has been around for a long time. Of course, like guys go to the training room. They've been going to the training room long before strength coaches came in and strength and conditioning is still a relatively new field and, and we're still trying to, you know, solidify our positions and, and Hey, we're actually a valuable member of this team. And sometimes it's to a fault, you know, so you, sometimes you have to say those things so that, Hey, the more recognition the strength coaches get, the more that we take care of them, the better work they do, the better they involve other people, the better our players get, of course. But sometimes I think it's to a fault where we push, um, ATs and PTs and, and even baseball coaches, you know, we rub them the wrong way because we say too much or we do too much 
and it, it becomes obvious that it's not athlete first anymore. It's about us getting ours versus, hey, let's just help these guys however we can. I don't, I don't know if you agree, right. but it looks like no. you do. No, absolutely. And, and, you know, we touched a little bit that, uh, about this before you, you know, before we actually got on the, on the podcast here, when we were talking beforehand, um, how your wife is a, is a social worker, and that, that's a service-based industry. And I think sometimes a lot of strength coaches, to include my younger self, forgets that. It's a service-based industry. The, the, the pay scale is not perfect. It's not even anywhere close to being perfect. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, you're, you got into this realm because you want to help athletes perform uh, you want to be a part of that team culture, that team setting. It's exciting, you know, to go to the, to go work every day, or at least, you know, you should make it that way. Um, but at the end of the day, it's there, there is a lot of self validation that goes on in the industry because uh, for all intents and purposes, in many organizations, the, the strength coach is looked at as the janitor of the weight room, you know, and I, I think there's a lot of um, misunderstanding of what this role is and the actual formal education it takes to to get to where you are as a triple A strength coach with the Red Sox and the path you've taken, it's, it's much more than, you know, chest day, back day, leg day, and, and putting the 45s back on the, on the squat rack. It's, it's much, much more than that. And sometimes I wish this field and coaches that work, not just, not just pro ball, but you know, your volleyball coaches, your men's basketball coaches in the college setting. I, I think that um, there needs to be a greater degree of education on how we got to where we are and, you know, a greater degree of respect for what we do. And, and I think that all stems from the, the self-validation that's needed by strength and conditioning practitioners and why uh, many times we get into that position where we're placing our own egos, our own programming, and I'll oh, look at all my, my three, four, five hitters, look what their averages, how many home runs they're hitting because of my leg programming, as opposed to, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm a part of this organization and I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to make it better than it was before I got here, you know. Yeah, and I feel like to piggyback off of what you're saying, Johnny, I think there needs to be overall less finger pointing at each other and there needs to be more uplifting of each other in profession. Sure. I mean, you know, from an athletic training standpoint and a rehab standpoint and a strength and conditioning standpoint, at the end of the day, we are hopefully all there because we do have an affinity towards the game of baseball and to serve these athletes. And I think we get a little bit too caught in sometimes our own little silo. We all have our areas that we have to prove ourselves with in the rehab department you know of course the team is always wondering why this player is taking longer to rehab or uh you know are you going too fast or too slow and we have that pressure as a strength coach oftentimes they're the the first person to be blamed for any injury it's just you know what i've seen in my in my practice hopefully that's changed since not working uh in in professional baseball but i think there needs to be less of you know why did this athlete get or whose fault is it that this athlete got hurt and more about how can we complement each other and I, I really think there should be a culture shift if there's any athletic trainers that are listening to this podcast which I'm sure there are I would I would urge you when you show up to the facility try and find one thing to grow from one another one area that that strength coach brings to the table that you can learn from and vice versa. Take the strength coach aside and say, Hey man, or, or, or girl for that matter, this is something that I learned in school or that I implement. I just wanted to share this with you. I think if we do that, then we're going to show these departments are worth together in numbers. And it's less about what you just did with the athlete. It's more about what your connection is to not just the athlete, but your colleagues. And you can start changing that by helping the development of your colleagues and helping your own development by learning from them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm there with you. And I love what you guys said about bouncing ideas off of each other and learning from each other and almost to the point of bothering each other, it sounds like, which is a good thing, honestly. Um, yeah, it does think, it every day. <laughs> I think sometimes it gets to the point where we just get so sucked into our given area that, you know, like you said, Johnny, sometimes there's times where you just look through the, the glass and the trainer's got 100 guys in the training room and they're doing that and you got 50 guys in the weight room and they're doing that. And, you know, before you know it, you're 10 hours deep and it's like, I just want to go home. Well, you know, sometimes you have to have those conversations and, and I don't think being tired or a long day is, is an excuse. If, if you can ha learn from somebody, learn from somebody, whether it's the PT, the AT, the base running coach, the outfield coach, the pitching coach, it doesn't matter if you just have those conversations, especially in the pro ball setting where we 
literally spend every day together. It's like you said, you, you get up really early, you're at the yard all day. Your sole purpose is to help those guys until you go to bed tonight in whatever hotel you're, you're staying at, you're together so much that if you refuse to learn from those people, it's almost hard to, to not learn from somebody because you're together so much. You have to have conversations. And if you don't, they're going to look at you like, this guy's kind of an asshole. I don't, I don't really like being I mean, around him. I mean, to give you a perfect example and show you that this isn't just smoke and mirrors for a podcast. I mean, everything from tall kneeling D2 flexion to half kneeling overhead presses with kettlebells um, to how to correctly perform a Thomas stretch on a ball player. I mean, all these things that I carried through with my career that I implement to some degree to this day, I learned from Dave. You know what I mean? So I, I, can, I can write down a whole list of things that I took from him as a professional that made me better as a strength coach and vice versa. And I, I want to share publicly one thing or the biggest thing I learned from this guy. I, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm somebody that doesn't really love titles. I don't love physical therapist, athletic trainer, strength coach. I really am more about the person and the, the, you know, what's behind that title. And this guy here, if he, if he was a physician, if he was a strength coach, whatever you want to call him, this man develops rapport with people. Now he does it in the sales world professionally for a big tech company. And let me tell you something. There is something to be said for the ability to, de to develop rapport with an athlete. I don't care if you're an athletic trainer, the rehab coordinator, the AAA strength coach, the major league strength coach, whoever. You need to be able to, to get that buy-in and you need to be able to develop that rapport. And something I learned from Johnny is his ability to almost, I mean, if I ever saw a human chameleon, he is it. He was able to adapt to the personalities of the athletes, whether he really, you know, it was always genuine, but he always found common ground and not just finding common ground, but then he was able to change his conversation style. He was able to change his perspective with each and every athlete where it was almost mind boggling. I'm like, Johnny, this is the most difficult athlete in the world. How the heck did you do that? And I still take notes to this day, but I guess the take home there is, you might be able to learn something outside of that quote unquote title from, from your colleague. You might learn something that has nothing to do with their educational background or their certification or their license. You might learn something just about how they connect with that athlete. And as a, as a successful strength coach, I think the really good ones that I've seen, they, they're really good at connecting with the athletes. And this is not a knock on athletic trainers or physical therapists, but I think a few of you out there that are listening, maybe you can learn that from, from one of the strength coaches that has to do that to rely on his job security and his buy-in from his athletes. Yeah, that's, um, that's something I, I definitely initially took from Coach Cochran at Alabama. Um, I've never seen anything like it before in my life. I mean, you have anywhere from 70 to 80 guys over the summer, you know, lining up, you know, in the, in the goal line from – you know, anywhere from five to six o'clock in the morning, and they know they're about to be run through absolute hell in, in the hot summer of Alabama. And you have 70 to 80 guys out there from lower socioeconomic communities and backgrounds that in many cases don't have too much regard for authority and, and authoritative figures and things like that. And Coach Cochran, the second he opened his mouth or snapped his finger and blew his whistle, I mean, all these guys were just locked into him. They would run head first into a brick wall for him. And Yes, he was loud. Yes, he was loud from 5 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night, and there was no in-between. Um, but his ability to connect with those football players is something that I took in my career. And, you know, he didn't walk around like, you know, an elitist exercise scientist, like he was better than the athletes or better than the athletic trainer. He, he was who he was. And I think that that's something that the players respected is that he didn't try to put on this face mask of a strength coach. Um, that's there to, you know, dictate who you are and what you do and don't drink in my weight room and don't do this in my weight room and all this other kind of stuff. It was more of like a, almost like an older brother, crazy uncle type relationship with these players. And that's something that I kind of took with me and took to the Cardinals and things like that. And, you know, a lot of guys that are in the big leagues today from Luke Weaver to Carson Kelly to Luke Voigt and things like that. I had them all in my roster. Um, and I, I think Dave can attest to it because we were both in Jupiter. I, I had a, a, a pretty decent relationship with all those guys um, to the point of which, I mean, at the start of the season, they kept making fun of me about my bright yellow Nike Romaleo twos. 
And then halfway through the season before the All-Star break, almost the whole entire clubhouse had him, you know. Um, so just having, having that relationship and that rapport, you've had some amazing strength coaches on this podcast, and I'm nowhere near the practitioner that half of them are. Without question, I'm not. But I think the one thing that I will say that I think I can do the best is, you know, developing a relationship with the Latin players, developing the relationship with the guys that, you know, just came out of a big SEC program or, you know, the guy that comes from rich suburbia, um, you know, coastal California or New York and things like that. doesn't matter where they come from, doesn't matter their ethnicity, their socioeconomic background. I can develop a rapport with them and, and develop a relationship with them. And I think that's what um, led to my success as a strength coach, much more so than the X's and O's. Yeah, the best coaches that I've been around strength and conditioning wise, I agree with both of you, are just they have an uncanny ability to just relate to players. And it's literally, like you said, some of the hardest guys that you're like, this guy doesn't like to talk to anybody. And he's just having full blown conversations with with a strength coach. And the, I think what, again, what it boils down to, we've mentioned it many times, is the athletes can tell when you have their best interest in, in your heart, in your mind, and you're not there to self-promote. You're there to get them better, and it's genuine. And when they see that, they just latch on to you because they know, hey, this guy isn't going to throw me under the bus the second that, you know, he gets a promotion somewhere else. Like, I, I, there's guys with the Pirates that I had in 2015 and I still keep in touch with now, and I think it was just the relationships we had built. We were, we were all young. We were all in rookie ball, and we didn't know any better, but we were in it together. We were riding the buses together. We were playing in Bristol, Tennessee together. And, you know, I still keep in touch with a lot of those guys just because of the relationships we had built. And it, it was just all I want is for you guys to be at your best every night. That's it. It's if I'm exhausted, if I miss a, if I miss pregame meal or whatever, I don't get to eat for 10 hours because I'm trying to help you guys get better. I mean, so be it. And the athletes see that, you know, they're not dumb. Um, at all they're very very intuitive they're very aware of their surroundings and who really has their best interest at heart and usually those are the, the strength coaches that tend to rise to the top um and the, the ones that can't connect with players i mean to be honest with you those are the guys that are sitting in the office bitter when they see you out you know working with a guy that's difficult to work with i'm sure you experienced it yourself in one setting or another where you're working with a guy who's difficult and other people are sitting in the corner just you know talking shit that oh, I don't understand why this guy likes this guy so much like we've been trying to do things for him but it's just because you have their best interest and you try to connect with them however possible yeah and I and I think another thing um any strength coaches that are in the Florida State League that might be listening to this right now um or any higher affiliates that are in the state of Florida I think the double a for the Marlins is in Jacksonville or outside Jacksonville I think right um I think one of the things that really helped me develop rapport as a strength coach down in Florida. Uh, I leveraged my network. Um, coming out of Alabama, I met a lot of people, a lot of great strength coaches around the country. Um, and so, you know, when you're on the road as a strength coach, particularly, you know, low A, high A, double A, um, you know, you either have the rinky dink weight room that you're in, in, in whatever ballpark you're in, um, or you're on the road and you have to go to the local YMCA or you have to go to the local Planet Fitness or UFIT, which was big down there in Florida. Um, so instead of trying to get guys up, while we're on a road trip to go to a place like planet fitness, where there's absolutely no driver desire to go into there. Um, something I did was I leveraged my network and I reached out to the local college strength coaches in the town that we were in. So for example, if we were in Bradenton and we were playing the pirates, I was getting on the phone with the guys at IMG and I can't tell you how many times, you know, I brought Mason Katz and Luke Weaver and Luke Voigt over to the IMG weight room. And I think when you go above and beyond like that for them, um, it makes you, I think it makes the players appreciate that you're trying to give them a better experience as a strength coach instead of wake up, get up, get on the bus. We're going to YM, we're going to the YMCA at, you know, 10 AM, be there sharp. I'm taking, taking roll and all this other kind of stuff. It's like, you know, if, if you go above and beyond a little bit to try and show them that you care, in which case I did, you know, like I, I'd try to bring them to IMG or I'd bring them to another college setting down in South Florida, just to, you know, it, increase the uh, the excitement of wanting to continue to train during the season and being in an environment that was conducive for wanting to get after it you know just little things like that um you know if, if you're not a chatterbox from new york like i am that it, you know you're not the most talkative person in the world but there's other ways to combat that that you can kind of develop rapport with these guys yeah so kind of building off of this a little bit is 
I want to know if you have any situations specifically that come to mind. You don't have to say players' names or anything, but just where you guys were able to effectively navigate a situation where um, maybe you had a difficult personality that had rehab to get done or like a long, long uh, rehab that, hey, maybe mentally this guy's not there, um, but we need to get him through. Just anything that sticks out in your mind where you guys were able to work together to get the best out of that athlete. Yeah, uh, a big a, a, a situation that I think both of us could attest to is our work with Ryan Sheriff. And I don't mind mentioning his name because Ryan and I talk about it all the time. Um, he had a, an interesting knee injury back in 2015, and it was a little bit of a ligament thing. Not too high grade, but it, was, it took him a little longer than, than he would have hoped. And Ryan and I, Ryan, we always joke around. We didn't really like each other at first because he was super salty for being down there. He was just trying to make his make his trek up there to AAA. And, you know, now fast forward, he, he played in the big leagues a few seasons and whatnot, um, now with the Rays. But there were a few moments where I was losing him and his trust, and we were having a tough time building that rapport for each other. And Johnny, of course, being the strength coach in Jupiter, was able to kind of keep Ryan's spirits high. His training, his, his strength and conditioning was the highlight of his day, oftentimes, especially working around the knee injury he had. And, of course, Johnny and I worked hand-in-hand hand together to, to help kind of, you know, make sure he was doing the right things, not the wrong things. Um, but Johnny really was able to lift his spirits up in the workout, help him feel like he was working towards some, you know, some specific goals. And like I mentioned earlier, I hate to use this phrase, good cop, bad cop, but it was a little bit of that, but I was okay with it. I, I started to depart a little bit from, oh, I'm the bad cop. I don't want to be known as that. And I was a little bit more comfortable with just letting Johnny run with, hey, man, I think this guy needs you right now. I think you might be a little bit better to build, build the rapport up with him. And during those moments, lo and behold, he came back into the training room with a different outlook with me because he hears Johnny saying positive things about me. And he's like, well, this guy must mean well. And he slowly began to shift. And if you fast forward, talked about like a success case. Well, I mean, Johnny and I are both, I would say, best friends with Sheriff at this point. And so we turned that one around, turned, you know, handed lemons, turned it into lemonade. And I think we did that by allowing each other to fill in the gaps with what the player needed. And so I would just say overall, navigating a difficult situation with an athlete, sometimes you can rely on others that might be able to connect in a different way that if for a reason the chemistry is not allowing it. Yeah, and, and you know, to piggyback off of what Dave said, um, you know, to this day, I haven't been in a professional baseball uniform overseeing Ryan Sheriff since 2015. And as of what, two weeks ago when this whole outbreak started and you know, everybody was kind of relieved of their regular routines at spring training and the delay of the start of uh, opening day. Um, you know, he's been to everybody from Eric Cressy to some of the best places out on the West Coast. And the first two people that he FaceTimes are, are Dave and I. And it almost got to a point where the situation wasn't really as certain as it is now where everybody's just going to stay quarantined and isolated and we're going to ride this thing out together when it was initially kind of flaring up. Um, we were potentially talking about, you know, Dave Skyping and FaceTiming him for his arm care protocols. And then he was going to fly out and stay with me in New York City so I could work with him here in New York um, just until things calmed down and he could go back to his team. Um, and again, you know, Dave and I haven't been in a professional uniform overseeing Ryan Sheriff since then. And the fact that fast forward several years later, um, you know, because of the relationship we built with him, you know, we're the were the first two that he's kind of reaching out to to kind of, you know, oversee that. Yeah, the fact that he keeps in touch with you guys, I mean, obviously speaks for itself on the relationship that you built with him and the rapport that you built with him and how much he trusts you guys for sure. Yeah, I think uh, I think that sometimes we all need to take a step back and realize that at the end of the guy, at the end of the day, these guys are human beings before they're a ball player, and you know, it doesn't matter if you're in baseball, doesn't matter if you're in sales, doesn't matter if you're you know, working insurance, if you don't have somebody's trust, uh, the efficacy of the relationship is not really going to go too far, no matter what it is you're trying to achieve on both ends. 
Yeah, for sure, man. I'm, I'm there with you 100%. And honestly, in pro ball, a lot of guys won't do anything for you until they trust you, until they, they know that you have their best interest uh, in mind. And uh, like I said earlier, it shows that, you know, guys know when, hey, this guy only cares about me just getting better. And they know when, hey, this guy's just out here trying to promote himself. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's something that, <clears throat> as a strength coach, you know, you and I can relate on more so is, you know, there's a lot of self-promotion and, you know, self-validation through Instagram and Twitter and everything else as it comes to being a full-time strength coach. And, you know, earlier on in my career, I was definitely all about that and marketing myself and whatever you want to call it. Um, but the more and more time went on, I was just like, I, I could care less if people see what I'm doing with my athlete. You know what I mean? Last Last year, when I was out of a formal organization, I left FAU and, you know, I had the opportunity to work with A.J. Ramos, uh, who a couple of years back was a closer for the Mets, um, HHS and the physicians in the hospitals there. You know, he had a rotator cuff injury. And um, unfortunately, it was the last year of his contract with the Mets. So I'm not, I'm not sure if he's, you know, re-signed with anybody yet. But, you know, uh, I worked with him for the better part of, you know, three to four months. Um, I was in contact with the, PT, the Mets PT there at HSS and, you know, just going through the relationship with him. And he was roommates with John Carlos Stanton here in New York uh, during the second half of the season. And, you know, initially, you know, back earlier in my career, I would have been all over Instagram and having him follow me and having me share my videos and stuff. And I was just like, dude, I don't care. You know, let's get a lift in and let's go get, grab a bite to eat, you know, afterwards. I, I didn't really care about, you know, the price point of each session or, you know, can you share me and can you tag me? Can you tell John Carlo about me? Like, I, I didn't, I just, I didn't care. You know, I just didn't. Yeah, we talked about it beforehand with all the Instagram stuff. Just everybody and their brother now is some sort of high-level trainer or strength coach who has somebody that works under them that, oh, all these people are coming to me and follow my programs and this and that. And, it, again, it goes back to the point that we were making about, you know, just there is a point where you have to, to self-promote a little bit for the betterment of, whatever it is, your organization or your strength and conditioning staff as a whole. But once you cross that line, it's, it's really not ideal. Yeah. I mean, if imagine, you know, being that a strength coach at the end of the day, if you're a strength coach in pro bowl, if you're a personal treading here at Equinox in New York city, I mean, can you, it, it's a service-based industry. Can you imagine if nurses and social workers and hospice care workers went around and started promoting the, the patients that they're working with? And I mean, granted that's a HIPAA violation, but at the end of the day, like, you know, self-promoting themselves as, as a nurse or a social worker, it's a bird. Get into it for that. They get into it to people. You know what I mean? And I feel like sometimes people in this industry, to include my younger self, need to remember that. For sure. So do you guys have any advice for either strength coaches or PTs or ATs, just how they can improve upon these working relationships for the, the sake of the athletes? Yeah, I mean, in terms of just any advice I have out there for – any strength coaches, athletic trainers, physical therapists in professional baseball, and really in any other sport is to prioritize the human connection with your colleagues and try and find the common ground in terms of personal development. Learn from each other, however you can, in the disciplines that you're not confident with. For me and Johnny, Olympic lifting was something I learned a ton about that I didn't have a solid, un real true understanding of before working with him. Not that I didn't do any Olympic lifting. I just didn't understand the biomechanics behind it and the proper coaching of it. And I think, you know, I also learned a ton in terms of rapport building, just observing him. So I just encourage everybody out there to try and do the same thing, learn from the strength coach and the strength coach should be learning from everybody else uh, equally. And it's an equal, you know, press forward to develop professionally and personally and it makes it a hell of a lot more enjoyable when you have a friend and I, you know, I consider Johnny a best friend. So we got each other through some tough moments there, uh, both trying to stay afloat in the game. And uh, I just want to thank you, Chris, for inviting us on, inviting me on. It's a really a pleasure talking to you about some really important topics that I think need to be discussed a little bit more. And uh, you're doing a great thing by sharing this podcast with the strength and conditioning community. And I, I hope we can get this out there to more physical therapists and athletic trainers also to join along and, and get the other side of it. So yeah, Chris, uh, you know, obviously this is my second time uh, being with you on the podcast. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you. I think this was a great experience. Um, 
and you know just to kind of relive some of the stories and that process uh, that Dave and I went through in my time with the Cardinals it really kind of gives me the chills thinking about it I, I really do miss the game um, there's some beautiful aspects uh, to, to being with an organization and you know watching the guys compete watching the guys that you work with in the lower levels get to move up and fulfill their dreams it's, it's amazing to be a part of something like that but um, you know to any listeners out there uh, that are in pro ball college ball whatever the case might be um, stop segmenting yourself as I'm the strength coach and that's the athletic trainer and we're two different departments. Um, you're a performance team. Look at yourself as a performance team. You're, you're there to work for a common goal and the common good of the athletes, the organization, the head coach and his team. Um, you know, stop, stop with this whole stay in your lane thing. Merge together, merge your ideas together, get to know one another. Um, you know, the athletic trainer is somebody is a human being and a person outside of somebody who's just icing a pitcher's arm after they throw a side during the middle of the week, um, you know, and, and, and vice versa. You know, a strength coach is much more than a person who, you know, hikes his shorts up to let his quads hang out and who likes to, you know, put on mega death music, you know, when he's hitting a, a PR in the back squat. There's much more to the person underneath. And, you know, the more you can kind of learn about the other person and develop that cohesiveness as a team, the more you can improve upon the legitimacy um, of your sports medicine, your strength and conditioning team within the organization. Yeah, for sure, man. I love it. And uh, again, I appreciate you coming on again for a second time. Um, and maybe in the future, we can do some more group chats. And uh, both of you guys, I look forward, Dave, to hearing more of your podcasts and uh, keeping in touch with you in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Chris, thank you. And uh, if you guys want to check out my podcast, it's called Injured to Elite. You could find it on all the major podcast apps. It's not just baseball specific, but there's a lot of baseball content on there. And it's just really about mindset, the physical side, and also a little bit of the spiritual side in terms of a holistic approach towards bettering your life, toward your dreams. So uh, I hope uh, people will find that interesting. For sure, man. And I'll link it up in the show notes and everything. And, uh, you have a subscriber here from me just listening to you guys talk on the podcast. So I look forward to future content from you, man. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. All right, guys. Chris, appreciate best, you. Be, best of luck with the rest of the season. I hope everything goes well. Yes, sir. Talk soon. Have a good one. All right, everybody. That concludes this episode with David and Johnny. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I think this is a really, really important topic to hit on. And I think these two embody what the strength coach medical staff relationship should look like. Three things that I took from these guys in this episode. Don't be afraid to call each other out in a respectful manner. Try to operate on a player first mentality and work to learn from everyone in your organization and not just those in your department. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll talk to you again on the next one. Mm -hmm.